right, then let's uh, call this meeting of March 3rd Regional School Committee to order. Uh, just as a note, today is the region's uh, fiscal 16 budget hearing. So we will obviously um, have a few more budget things to discuss, and that will be our official budget hearing. So, but before we get to that, let's uh, any community comments? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> let's start with the state of the district. Uh, we'll start with the middle. Here first. So it's all yours, yes. Okay, so um, just a couple happenings over at the middle school. On um, Monday, we had a school student council meeting. Went very well. On this uh, next Friday, March 13th, we have middle school trivia night hosted by student council, so it should be fun. Um, on Wednesday, March 18th, we have an early release. And on Thursday, March 26th, there's internet safety night at 6.30 at Memphis, so all about internet safety. And on Friday, March 27th, it's the middle school talent show. And um, then on Thursday, April 12th, we start MCAS, which is always fun. <laughs> on Thursday, the seventh grade long comp. And Tuesday, April 7th, uh, there's the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade ELA. And then on Thursday, the April 9th, we finish off with just one more ELA. And some student recognition is sixth graders Amelia Hudson Walker and Anna Davis held their first group rehearsal this Saturday, February 29th, 28th, in preparation for their for the prestigious All-State Treble Chorus Concert. High school juniors uh, Priya Prisha Osk will also be performing that day in the high school mixed All-State Chorus. Uh, the annual student-faculty basketball game was held on Friday, February 13th. The game was hard-fought match and with the sixth grade, sixth grade groups keeping the students in the game. Um, ultimate, ultimately, the teachers won, but it was always they fun. Always do. Yeah, they always win. <laughs> they always win. Yeah. I think I think we've won once. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you look behind you, there's some artwork. Um, so this month features work artwork from Miss Simino's seventh grade students. After analyzing uh, work from several prominent real artists such as Myro Dolly Magritte and contemporary artist Sandy Skoglund. Uh, students created a surreal self-portrait inspired from an emotional event that happened in their own life. Um, take a moment after the meeting to look and see if you can guess what happened. So, they're pretty interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Somebody went to Cooper's town. Yeah. So that's, it. that's what's happening with me. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. The MCAS dates were changed the space extended the testing period, and we did elect the new part of MCAS testing back. So if parents would look at the original schedule, we would for Tuesday or 24th, and we would the original date for long comp. It's now April 7th. And the makeup date for long comp would be April 8th, which is no release day. The other piece of information that got earlier today was that Patrick Foster, one of our eighth graders, has advanced to the state competition for the uh, Geography B. That will be on March 27th at the Display Academy. So we're very excited for that. Congratulations. I just have to say, Ron Kelly and Dave Bond here. Because um, you mentioned in your report, Scott, the um, bring your own device. Yes. And we're looking at that. We, we've just gone. Brian Barringer and Anthony Rotaco and a few others went and visited Rosley uh, last week. No, from 13th of February. And they're trying to remember, just to give an idea of yep, what's going how on. it works. Mm -hmm. and, right, because I, I was hearing and I read something the other day uh, ebook versus the physical book and, and comprehension and that kind of thing. And I was wondering. You know, as you guys look at that, are you taking into consideration yes. both both? 
Thanks. You're welcome to wait for Catherine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so um, some re some very soon events are. So tomorrow is the blood drive that uh, the student council is hosting. And this year we had one of the Red Cross representatives come in. And um, apparently there's a huge need for blood this year because every time there's a snow day, it's like a lot of people can't come in and donate. So they, we have about 70 kids signed up to donate right now. So hopefully at least half of them can like make it on and actually donate. Because a lot of the times, depending on like if you go somewhere for vacation, you can't. So that's tomorrow, and that's a big day. Um, also, we have later in March, we have the school musical, which is Greece. That's the 19th, I think, and um, Thursday, which is the first show. And then, yeah, so it's Greece this year, and um, just came from rehearsal, and it's looking great. And um, we also have um, spring sports. They're starting, and so that's baseball, softball, lacrosse, sailing, tennis, um, track. That's like 200 kids, so it's a lot of people. I think a lot of people are really excited for the season. Yeah, so that's what's happening. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Uh, I just wanted to recognize a few students in your packing. You saw that both Mark Seisler and Sarah Plath were um, nominated for a Presidential Scholars um, Award uh, program. That enables them to apply for some additional scholarship, but it also really puts them in a um, really strong category of students across the nation. So both Mark and Sarah should be congratulated today. Uh, I received word that Amelia Walsh and Michelle Alessandro have received um, Presidential Community Service Awards. So what that basically means is they've done their community service, they've done the requirements here, but they also now have submitted for national, potential national awards and they were recognized as president. It's pretty neat. There's a um, nice plaque for them. And um, so we received that today, which was fantastic. Um, I want to congratulate our winter sports team. We so many teams who are so successful. Uh, special congratulations to the Al Boys Alpine team. But I think that there were so many different stories um, throughout the winter that really made us proud in so many different ways. Um, the girls ice hockey team, the three all-stars who got to play in that uh, South Suburban game. Our boys team that won their uh, first tournament game. The boys basketball team that won their first tournament game. Great turnout for boys basketball at the tournament game, so thanks to the crowd. I thought that was fantastic. Um, it was really just a, a great feeling to be, I think, part of so many real positive things. And I also wanted to, and I recognize it in my uh, facilities at Fiscal Plant, the work of Chris Hendricks, the work of Dean Bogan and Dave Pasillo, um, and all of us in the, that crew. They, um, on top of handling so many things with the snow, are also doing their jobs. Uh, which certainly entails an awful lot. And I'm so appreciative because, you know, we're constantly pulling them for different things. And Dean had to set up for us today. And meanwhile, he was helping out. I think they thought of there with something. So um, we truly are lucky and fortunate to have such a nice crew that really does work hard, cares a lot about the school, has an awful lot of pride. One of the neat things that uh, I've always appreciated is our coaches have always kind of honored them by providing them with DS gear and if they were something. So our guys always wear it proudly, and it just makes me feel uh, good to be in the school system that, that values everybody. Fantastic. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, to dovetail uh, what Mr. Smith and Mr. Kellett offered, uh, just our heartfelt thanks for filling the facility system wide. Uh, really an extraordinary effort. We had a couple of ice dams in the other buildings, we had some frost beef issues, we had a few things that popped up, but relatively speaking, we fared pretty well. And we have actually posted our groundskeeper position. Uh, we have an opening at the region for a full-time groundskeeper, so that is posted and open. So we're, uh, maybe that will bring some spring weather. <laughs> um, in terms of the business office, um, business manager search committee uh, meets tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock. 
we had uh, actually one more operating with 26 total applicants in the position. So uh, we thank Mrs. Graham for her contribution to the committee, and we will uh, we'll resume our work uh, tomorrow. Thank you. And Dr. Luke, and Ms. Kelly, all on that committee as well. The business office associate position closed on uh, Monday, February 23rd. We had a total of 34 applicants for the position. So Ms. Tate and I would sit down and go through all of that and begin that uh, screening process. Just another task for us to, to accomplish. So uh, we will get to work on that. I think Mr. Lee will probably speak to uh, Ms. Grisell for the capital. But we did want to bring attention again to the NECO grant reductions. We itemized them here. Um, we really suffered a fiscal year 15 reduction in that grant to the tune of $14,835 to date. Um, so that is something we're trying very creatively um, to, to close that, that gap because that is a um, current year gap and we do not know how it will fare in fiscal 16 for the micro program. We talked about that last week in the joint meeting. Mr. Keller alluded to the MCAS administration schedule, including the package you'll find in the uh, revised assessment schedule for your review as well. Um, we also include in the packet some crosswalks that have been provided for NEAS. This is the very latest off the publication uh, for NEAS. And I know Mr. Smith is going to convene a group and begin to review some of those crosswalks. Being with Dr. Parkinson or something. Uh, that was really NEAS's effort to say, here's how we see the Common Core and the CPSS issues uh, aligning with many of the, the state and federal mandates. So that those two publications that actually came out of the committee that's been formed at NEAS, uh, among the NEAS members. So we'll see how that resonates mm -hmm. with not only us, but uh, with the other school districts as well. So they're, sorry, Steve, they're looking for our feedback on mm -hmm. as to does this represent the world as we see it? Is that? Mm -hmm. part of it, yes. okay. They've also, if I may, uh, have invited principals uh, to a, a conference. It's something new for them. Uh, similar type of thing to get some additional feedback, changes they're making, you know, sort of hear our voice. They've also done something very similar with the superintendents. They traditionally have an annual meeting, but it's been much more formalized. They're trying to really uh, handle this from a grassroots stance, which I think is smart, uh, because they can then really give good feedback. Oh, so we're, we're encouraged. Oh, that's great. That's good. At least the communication line is real good. Yeah. They're yeah. hearing the voice. Absolutely. I want to thank uh, Ms. Crisell. We participated in a conference call with uh, Mrs. Hunter and with Dover's Town Council concerning the Minuteman local arrangement. <laughs> and literally this afternoon, I mean, quite literally off the press, came a building project option projected costs, a series of spreadsheets, which I don't know if Lori's had a chance to pour through them yet, but um, I, I certainly have not. Uh, but it is interesting, so we'll have to, I think, look at this, look this over, Larry, and get in touch with Robin. This was cut off the press and see um, where Dover wants to head um, in terms of the Dover School Committee and bring this to the region as well. But literally, it's just four o'clock this afternoon. So. so, looking to try to come up with something where we can have a number of seats at Minuteman with an established tuition and an established facility use fee. It would be sort of commensurate with what our volume is for using Minuteman as a school. Um, so we'll keep you posted on, on that front as well. Do you happen to know for the March 17th presentation that's happening, whether that the one that's happening in the town hall, yeah. that we to which we've been invited, do you know how that will the, what what that will present? I, I can only imagine that this is probably a precursor to that PowerPoint, so we can share this out. It's just that the the quality of it was literally, I mean, you can yeah, see some of the pages are sort of blacked out. Um, but essentially, they're looking at five different construction projects. One is a brand new building, everything to repairing existing buildings, sort of everything in between. So they have five different sort of build out and construction scenarios. So I imagine this will be a walk through the 17 of exactly this. Okay. If we learn otherwise, we'll let you know. Um, and the joint school pay package is the grant table. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that last week. And then there are some other notes in here. We, we hope for some kind of a release on the, at least a precursor to the governor's budget tomorrow, March 4th. We hope. Um, there were some little tidbits of news that were sort of uh, trickling through the communication lines today, but nothing that we're totally comfortable with or have had a chance to really 
we have to dissect as of yet. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah. And I think everything else we pretty much kind of, I know Jeb mentioned the Internet Safety Night coming up, and just the challenge success of that last Friday night that was held at Chickering School, very solid administrative representation, hundreds of parents in attendance, um, really across all the schools, and it was a nice showing. And Denise Pope herself was um, the keynote speaker. So it really was, I think, a dynamite representation. Uh, John has got wide range of parents to be while uh, I was I was really pleased and really grateful that you know on um, Friday night we had some time for something important that the time out of our own personal schedule so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Alan Shagman delivered with just so much credit. Mm -hmm. She's just remarkable as a regional she is really guidance good. director and she's like she's becoming a K twelve <laughs> you know guidance director it seems she does nice work. So yes. she really we, we thank her for that question. So how, uh, what was the, the role of that meeting in the whole process? Okay, so that was the, kind of the parent person, uh, Dr. Pope talked a little bit about schools and how schools play a role in making some of these changes and parents and communities. And it really primarily was kind of focused on, you know, these are the things that are stressors in kids' lives. and, and she talked a little bit about her own personal experiences. She talked about some of the tools that Challenge Success uses to evaluate the stressors and things that they encourage with uh, schools, but then also communities. So it really was the, the parent education forum and discussion. Thank you. That's, um, all, from my report. all right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, as you know, part of the educator evaluation is for students to participate in surveys that would give feedback to our educators about teaching and learning. And so we're about to launch into that portion of it in a pilot format. Um, we have been approached by Tripod, um, which is a, a nationwide company, um, to pilot some of those surveys in four of our schools before educators have come forward. Um, and then the EDFC member selected as a pilot district for their surveys and we spent today doing a long time for the middle school, high school, children, and last week um, showing those surveys for our educators and soliciting participants to pilot them. So we get some effective feedback. All of the feedback is um, only given to the educator. Um, and so far, the five pilot surveys, those educators are showing. So I think it's it's great. The administrators have also volunteered to be part of the staff survey. So we're going to get a comprehensive look at um, teaching and learning from the student perspective and from a staff perspective. So that's ongoing. We should have some more an update by the um, middle of it. Okay, this, uh, my question is probably more appropriate to the, the subcommittee evaluation, but since you brought up the fact that we're doing both, in fact, now we've had some, I guess, exposure to both. It, is there a strong overlap, a weak overlap between the two uh, surveys? There are similar questions asked. Um, what some people are noticing who have looked at both is that the, the language of one survey is stronger and easily under, more easily understood of another survey. But we'll bring everyone together to get a sense of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And and then the, the feedback mechanism the, the charts the data, the how it's presented, and findings for educators and how that influences their teaching and learning of our students is also an aspect of the survey. It's very exciting. Can you remind, is that mandated by a particular date or is that still could be different? The state had asked that they be implemented this calendar year, but they're allowing for this pilot form um, to be fully implemented next year. But as the state does, they could shift that date. Can't say with confidence. Um, and I wanted to just mention the walkthroughs. Mr. Kelly had mentioned them one time, but once a month I walked in with the administrators and I went looking truly at student engagement, what's being taught, how it's being taught, and how our our um, students are responding to that learning. And it hits so many goals as I did the walkthroughs. I'll be with Mr. Kelly and Mr. Smith next week. But when um, someone's launching uh, the new unit with the essential questions that links directly to goal number five in the units 
using a graphic organizer to synthesize ideas it's to the language-based goal um, and um, just seeing professional learning with teachers talking about teaching and learning it's been phenomenal to, be, to, to see those and to sit to, to, to walk up to a student and say may I look on with you and for them to tell me exactly what's happening in the so it's, it's just a phenomenal opportunity for us to to have a laser-like lens on um, the components of instruction. All right, Ms. Green. So we have more surveys to talk about. <laughs> so in conjunction with our, our special parent advisory group, we developed a parent survey. It was a goal of mine as well as that group to survey parents um, as we got through with the year regarding their thoughts about how things are going with the special education departments with all of the reorganization. We wanted to get feedback from parents about how they're feeling and how supported are they getting, you know, all the support and services that they would expect given all of the changes. So we'll be sending those out this week to all of our special education parents. And once we get the results of the survey, we're going to share them out of future school meetings so that um, we can talk a little bit about it. And I'm looking forward to seeing those results because I think it helps me to sort of plan ahead for well, what we, what are the goals, what are the initiatives for next year moving forward, what things have worked, what things do we need to um, take a look at. So I'm very much looking forward to it. There's a copy of it in your copy to look at. Um, we did a preliminary version and then it was vetted for several members of the CPAC group. We changed a few of the questions to be a little bit more specific to what we were looking for. So I think that it's pretty comprehensive and it's going to be a really good idea of what parents' thoughts and questions are at this point. How many surveys can we send up? Um, there we have a total of, and then we count to the number of special education surveys. Well, you know, that was there a question in there whether the student is in district or out of district? Yes. yes. Oh, that's right here. You saw this right here. Yeah. And there will be an opportunity for parents who have read and want to see in the district to I wanted to mention again that the parent, the CPAC group is sponsoring a parent um, workshop on 504 as an IEP, understanding the process for each of those in the different institutions of 504 planning. And that is going to be held on March 25th at 7 o'clock. Um, and the CPAC will be put on a The money one. The money time. <laughs> All right, Chris. What do you have to sell us? Well, I think the only year we have that, um, I think at this point in the budget, it's a new thing. Because we're starting to do all the rest of the money. Um, we don't actually need to We need to provide the projection that the school community before. But that doesn't include what we have to provide for. Yeah, I, mean, uh, <laughs> I think we really are going to have to wait until the season, hopefully, it's really good for us. I'm going to give my first estimate. Because even in Overton, of course, um, that was in that projection, didn't have the last uh, two weeks table. Yeah, they cleared the uh, the uh, And that was all double time and a half because of, it was a Sunday and we had to get ready for school. So um, that really is definitely an area in that speech and everybody else is pointing out. We are having difficulties with the emergency, but the energy management system, we've had Grinnell in here for the last five days, trying to trace down, uh, we couldn't see the software. Um, so they literally had to go through ceilings and trace down, there was a break in one of the lines, I sorted out one of the units. I have a 
and built for that as well. One thing that did come out of that, though, as well, is going to start looking at evaluating the newer technology that's out there uh, that you don't have to depend on hard wiring and stuff. And it is in the capital plan. It just may have to be moved up because of all the problems it's got no other issue. So, and I have to tell you, Ralph looks very quiet these days. <laughs> and he needs a little vacation. So, is the, uh, is the problem fixed? With it was fixed. Yes. They finally, after five days, they finally tracked it down and then corrected it. They have the four corners. But it was, it was actually a system, thanks for bringing that up, that Chickering looked at potentially one of those wireless mm -hmm. systems, of the tritium system, and um, it would be great to do it in all four schools, on all three campuses, so it may very well be a, a nice topical conversation for the Fiscal 17 capital, um, because, you know, Chickering was receptive to talking about it, um, and Pine Hill um, probably would be the same as the regional Alright, okay. So moving on to our discussion of the 16 operating budget. Um, maybe the easiest way to do this is to look through the presentation. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Why do you say, why don't I go with change? Uh, yeah, this is in the So um, just a few things have changed since. February 11th. This we're on our fourth version, so we're on the talking points. We're looking at red font only, we think. Um, and the first talking point just emphasizes the Chapter 71 reduction that was enacted by uh, then Governor Patrick uh, to the tune of $128,373. We have an exhibit, um, a, a document that actually looks at revenue and ties that out and actually shows school committee how that affected fiscal 15 and how that may affect fiscal year 16 in a, in a roll forward. And we'll get to that, I think, later in the presentation. But talking point number seven um, is an important one because it's quite germane to the conversation tonight. So at this time, we have three confirmed retirements out of the region at the end of this school year a high school nurse, a middle school music teacher, and a high, and a high school science teacher. Um, all three positions will be posted and filled. The February 5th budget change sheet reflects a $30,000 retirement and tuition savings attributable to middle school retirement. And the March 3rd sheet that we'll look at tonight takes into consideration another $30,000 tuition savings. That. Talking point number nine uh, breaks out the reductions in the metro grant, just so you're uh, fully apprised of that. Talking point number 10 speaks again to the um, reduction we suffered this fiscal year in Chapter 71. That's regional transportation to the tune of $128,373. Uh, talking point number 11 just draws you back. It was an old talking point that draws you back to the metro reductions again. Talking point number 15, as reflected on the salary analysis document dated uh, March 3rd, 2015, the net increase for all raises for administrators, administrative assistants, support staff, and custodians is approximately $61,000. And I do believe that's the best group that they just handed out. Yes. 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 Yes, that's the change. That's the change. Yes. Under the section school committee, talking point number two. This proposed budget, while releasing funds set aside for all contracts negotiated and settled in the past few months, also contains a placeholder in school committee negotiations line for the business office transitions in the amount of $10,000. We had talked about that before, but I don't think the dollar value would have been specified necessarily. Yeah. And just as you flip through, I'm just looking for red. And in the final stages here. So under insurance for employees, this speaks to the um, the health care rate that we set with a positive twelve point five percent. Um this takes spoke to that um, in mid February when that date was set the rate was set for the February calls to rate setting meeting. And on the special education out of district, we do like to bring the region's attention to some of the 
out of district costs that are born in the elementary schools budgets but are connected to regional age students so those talking points there give you it's simply an update those clearly are new it's not new spending per se but it's an update on where we are with out of district for both elementary schools and the concluding point is that the revised budget presented this evening that Ms. White, I think, will go through the um, PowerPoint on, reflects an overall 4.03% or $893,112 increase over fiscal year 15's regional budget. And the proposed fiscal year operating budget uh, totals $23,036,986. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I think instead of doing it on the overhead, we're just going to, because this uh, presentation is essentially the same as the one we went through on February 11th, so I don't think we need to belabor all the points and go through all of them. And just, so, Dana, for those watching at home, it's on our website. It is, right? it will be on the website tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> It's hot. Well, exactly. Exactly. Um, so the uh, the budget, as we talked about, is, was approached with appreciation to both towns that we have legally constrained property taxes, and get, and they that is what funds ninety percent of our school system. Uh, when we start this process, we get guidance from both Dover Warren and Sherman Advisory. Uh, Sherman Advisory gives us a specific percentage increase, which is made up of what we can increase our operating budget as well as what the increase for benefits is available to us. And then Dover, the guidance that we have received for the past several years has been just to provide local service. So our job is to, to try and combine those two directives and provide a budget, deliver a budget that meets the needs of our students in the district. Uh, we also have a goal of trying to continuously evaluate opportunities for enhanced academic experience as well as find financial efficiencies where I can. The assessments for the towns are listed there. Um, the next, the next slide talks about the operating expenses overall. As Steve said, the twenty million thirty six thousand nine eighty six, uh, which no surprise, the bulk of it comes from salary and other compensation as well as benefits. Almost eighty percent of our budget is set annually in those two buckets, uh, and the rest constituting the, the other twenty percent. And we'll get into what each of those those are. Uh, the slide five is the actual numbers behind those pie charts. Um, <coughs> salary income increasing by 5.7 and we're going to get into that number a little bit later as to what actually constitutes that 5.72 percent increase. Um, benefits are up almost 11 percent. Our other is down for some various bucket reasons uh, and then transportation leading us to a, an overall 4.03% increase in the budget. It's important when we think about a 4% increase in the budget, what does that actually come from? What, is, what makes up that 4%? Because it's not that everything across the board is up by 4%. Um, most importantly, in terms of we wanted to look at what is new for this year. So what are expenditures that are new to our budget that wouldn't be reflected in last year and that would constitute a significant portion of the increase? So our new in-district non-special ed related expenses that we believe allow us to provide level service to the students are those listed in that slide. So as we've talked about, and you've probably heard if you've been coming to meetings or watching them, that we have included a one new full-time uh, full teacher that will span both math and science. Uh, we will do professional development around qualified peer observation, which will enable our evaluation system. We do have an extra 0.5 adjustment counselor based on the caseloads of the students in our system. Uh, we, as Steve mentioned, we have money set aside for the business office transition. We have talked at length about the department chair for the performing arts, and the number that that um, comes out to is uh, $5,800. And then there are two buckets for athletics that are new this year. One is an ongoing commitment to fund the assistant coaches for the large non-cut sports that require uh, assistant coaches to provide safe ratios for our student athletes, coaches to student uh, uh, ratios. And then finally, the inclusion of winter track, which has been absorbed into our budget. So in other words, $128,000 of our increase comes from those new items that we believe provide level service to our students. Um, we also want to make sure that everyone is aware of 
the, the costs that come in our budget with respect to special education. It's important to know that um, thanks to Terry and her incredible team of, of educators in our district, our, we have a continued goal and a continued effort underway to retain students in district where we can and return students from out of district placements where possible, obviously while, all, while providing free and appropriate public education, which is really the, the underlying tenet of our special ed program. Um, it's important for, again, those of you who have been around, you'll, you've heard, heard different programs referred to, but we wanted to list some of the programs that support the efforts of bringing students back in district and keeping students in district, and those are listed here. So um, training in special reading programs, our education assistant uh, program, uh, uh, educators who are in our, in our school, the language-based work that we're doing now, our school psychologists and adjustment counselors, content that's being modified for students, small group work, individualized ELA and math programs, and consultation obviously where needed from experts. And all of those done with the goal of keeping kids in district, um, but obviously that comes at a cost. So the next slide articulates what some of those new expenses that come from supporting the needs of the special ed programs that try again to make sure that we're providing the education needed of our students. Those new industry sped expenses are two tier three education assistants, our teacher of the visually impaired, different contracted services, tutoring, IEP services, and then classroom equipment, some of which has come from chickering budgets that have now been absorbed up in the region. So that again is $175,000 of new spending that is in our budget uh, that is done to provide the programs that we need for the students. So those are the new dollars that we're spending. Then the question is, well, so how does that all add up in the, in the overall picture? Again, 80% of our budget comes from salaries, other compensation and benefits. So yes, there are some salary increases and we'll, we'll get into some specific numbers on that, which uh, some analysis that people have asked for. Um, we have retirement adjustments, we have teacher allocations, the benefits, as we talked about, was a big increase for, for everybody this year, certainly not just our district, but the towns and, and all, all parts of the Commonwealth. Funding for the business office transition, the instructional leadership position, our longevity payments, as we discussed at our last meeting, that is part of our new educator contract this year, and then the contribution towards retirement that we provide. Continuing with that 80%, uh, on the IT side, we have our 22 full-time equivalent share of our technology integrator, as well as the classroom technology acquisition or replacement program that is an annual program that is approximately $41,000 for each of the two buildings this year. We talked about our qualified peer observation and the instructional equipment athletics, but this is just shows what, what constitutes those buckets of, of 80%. The other 20%, uh, is pretty much everything else. So our utilities, transportation did, which thankfully came in lower than anticipated, which was a big benefit to all of us. Uh, some movement of money around between reserve funds to where it should belong. And then fortunately, I think for all involved, both towns, the wonderful financial benefit we received from refinancing the bond issuance uh, to the tune of $190,000 for this year, which would be uh, obviously a, a benefit on terms of the capital assessment to both towns. And as we referenced in our February 11th meeting, does not reflect any OPEB contributions um, beyond the pay as you go. And I think what we heard at our February 11th meeting is that there is a goal to begin exploring the concept of an OPEB trust by both towns at the region. But I would say, I would put that in the very preliminary um, exploration discussion category, but certainly not anything that would affect us this year. Uh, when we look at what the variance is, uh, no surprise when 80% of your costs are salaries, benefits, and other compensation, then 80% of your variance ends up being salaries, other compensation, and benefits. So this is a pie chart of, of how that the variance breaks down. Um, I think the, the next chart I wanted to spend a few minutes on, chart 13, because that's new for this particular um, presentation and came out of the discussions we had at our February 11th meeting where there was a question of, hmm, you, you're saying that your budget for salary compensation and benefits is going up by 5.72%. Does that mean everyone got a 5.72% raise? That doesn't seem quite right. 
So what we what we dug into, what Chris was able to dig into, was to really drill down on what that 5.72% actually means uh, and what, what constitutes that number. So what we did, the first line is the budget. Um, on the fiscal 2016 budget, starts with that February 11th number, so the 14,664 number. And so in other words, we're looking at a variance of 794 or an increase of 5.7%. Um, as we discussed at our last meeting, that's a little misleading for a few reasons. One, in fiscal 2015, there was a, quite a bit of money that was in other buckets because it, the, the budget was created before the educator contract was finished being negotiated. So money was living in other buckets and not in its proper bucket is the, I think the easiest way to say it. So if we put the money in the bucket it was supposed to be in, that was $202,000 in fiscal 15, which would mean that instead of comparing 16 to 13 million, we should be comparing fiscal 16 to 14 million. Um, so that's kind of point A. Point B was, um, as Chris mentioned, we've also had uh, $30,000 of of retirement that also needed, because if you wanted to compare apples to apples, you really need to add that back in if you want to figure out exactly how the, uh, what has been increased year over year. So what, we're, what we believe is that if you adjust the budget for those two items to compare, the actual variance is 4.4%, which still seems like it's a high number, and the question is, well then where does that come from? So if you go down if you break down the 4.42%, um, if you go back to the slides that talk about the new staff, well, almost half of that variance comes from the new staff that we've talked about. And I think we've talked a lot about why those new staff members are on board and the rationale behind including them. So in-district sped of 141,000, in-district regular ed of about 150,000. So in terms of new staff, $290,000, $291,000 of our increased costs come from those new staff costs, so or 2%. The actual, what has been the increase due to the educator contract is about, is 2.34%, and that comes from the various aspects of our educator contract. So lane changes, um, cost of living, and then moving in the steps within the matrix. So total attributed just to contract increase is $330,000 or 2.34%, which I think based on if you, the allocation of the tenure of our educators is is pretty much what I think Chris and her team would have expected to see. So I think that, I believe, answers the question that um, Sludgeman Crusoe had raised in the last meeting, which is, whoa, this is nowhere near what I thought we had discussed in the educator agreement Negotiation. negotiations. And it then is. the last, which yeah. looks like a rounding error, um, but isn't is that the net increase from any other positions is, is is very little again, which you would think is small, but it's basically because we netted out several positions. <sighs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, the model worked. <laughs> so I think that was I think that goes a long way to help you understand the variance and what is our most important line item, which is our salary, compensation, and benefits line. Um, so then chart 14 just talks about our revenue sources. Again, we talked about them quite a bit uh, on February 11th. We have two main parts, uh, sources of revenue. The first is our state aid chapter 70, which is uh, for, for education. Um, right now, it reflects an increase of 190246 which we continue to cross our fingers that that will come through and we'll hopefully know more in the next few weeks whether that's looking good, we hope. Um, and then Chapter 71, State Aid, which is Regional Transportation, that has not fared as well. We know that we've already absorbed nine C cuts of $128,000, which then also is reflected uh, in our fiscal 16 budget calculations. To that, we add excess and deficiency, which if you're not familiar with that term, is uh, essentially our rainy day fund, thank you. I was going to say slush fund, but that's not really no. <laughs> sort of party. Um, so our we Pretty have uh, our our committee has recommended that we use five hundred thousand dollars from our excess and deficiency again in fiscal sixteen, which is the same as we had in fiscal fifteen. Um, 
it, I, it's the right number for this year, but I definitely have to caution us all that fiscal 17 might not be as rosy because if fiscal 15 is B and D at the end, because of all of these hits that we're taking, doesn't if we're not able to return as much money as we usually do back to E and D, we might not have it for future years. So we're comfortable with that for this year, but it's definitely a flag that goes up for fiscal 17 planning. Uh, and then our fees are up in that same 4% range as our expenses have been and the grants we've talked about. So where does that leave us all? Um, the chart 15 is the gap analysis. We we what we wanted to do is try and walk through where we sit with respect to the guidance that Sherburn Advisory has given us. Uh, the two columns there are what we're calling the conservative approach and the ultra-conservative approach. Um, one includes that $190,000 of Chapter 70 money that we continue to hope comes in, uh, and then the other doesn't. So if, if we are, if the $190,000 comes in, then we should be within $159,000 of Sherburn's original guidance. Uh, and if it doesn't come in, we will be much further away. I guess it's the best way to put it. Um, and then we, we had talked a fair amount at our last meeting about what that $158,000, while we do believe that we are over Sherburn Advisory's guidance, we do believe that there's some considerations that uh, should be factored in when looking at that number in terms of Sherburn's overall commitment to education. And those two items would be uh, the basically how Pine Hill comes in with respect to both their current budget as well as their guidance uh, in terms of how they are this year versus the previous year. So that's hopefully where we are, hopefully on the conservative column. Uh, and then finally, we need to, uh, we want to update you on the capital so, I, you, but I, are you on? I, I did not bring copies. And I'm not sure whether. Can I just ask yeah. a quick yeah. question yeah, before we go to Capitol? Okay, before we do Capitol. So, when we hear from the governor tomorrow, will we know any more on 9C? Well, um, I think that'll kind of tell us that we finished the case for me. I believe it will tell us what we need to know about this as well. Okay. So it'll probably confirm that those nine seat cuts are done. And our twenty this is just to clarify, our twenty three million whatever includes the cuts? Or does Can you speak yeah. up a little bit clear? Twenty three million thirty six number, does that include the cuts? Nine seat cuts. Yeah. Yes. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm saying yes when you're saying yes. And that includes the reduction in the in the regional and that's why the new revenue. Every time we need to go over that, just. Uh, Chris did a great job at the last meeting of expanding your the revenue sources. This is in your packet. And really looking at it, tells us the entire story of what happened. This is 14, 15, what we expected, what was cut, where we'd sit, what we expect for 16, with and without you know, yeah. cuts. Yeah. It locks you to the break for the but again, we are we we are sort of banking on having the chapter seventy proceeds, one hundred ninety thousand, that's reflected in the gap analysis in the conservative approach. Right. Otherwise, we've got three percent. Yeah. And then we have the non yeah, no, let's so, add, yeah, let's, so why don't we ask the operating question? So I don't know if this was new or if I just missed it in the past. So it, it looks like it says here small group and skills level classes are incorporated into the, the specialist slash in-house district spent budget. So when we're given that uh, class size analysis each year, are those courses only taught by specialists, or would there be teachers who often teach general ed classes that will teach a small skills class? So these are a combination of things so in those circumstances, just from a bucket standpoint, they would be included in the generalist budget at the time that they're, they're in those courses. And it's 
only accredited special ed teachers who might be doing the skills course at the high school or middle school level that would fall into the special union district specialist budget. Yeah. Skills of regular education. Skills, skills of high school of right. regular education staff. Okay. Um, and if I 15 questions on the question of where we we'll end up with the uh, DMZ. Do you have an order of magnitude for the control of the care information? No. But I, I, I have guess. to tell you, um, I don't have that on Ralph every day on to get some numbers. In our contract, our annual contract with them, we lost some days that we've already paid for that if we don't use them, we don't we lose them. So they said they've worked with us. So that can take care of maybe three of the days. I just, I'm just trying to figure out if we're talking about 20,000 or 200,000. Oh, what an early view of that ENZ number. Mm -hmm. um, thousands. Yeah. Thousands, but not 10,000. No, no, no. Okay. I think I would that's not be putting 500,000 in front of you. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions on operating? How about that from our partners out in the audience? Any questions on operating? I have a question. Can you just talk us? Across these columns, sure. I'm just a little the revenue, bit. the revenue one, right? Yeah, okay. the pretty one. I just, I mean, basically, I see. I don't understand what the revised budget FY15 revised budget column is. Okay. What, what's different between the original and the revised budget? So the yeah. Okay, the original budget. Um, the original budget was approved. We didn't know about the state increase, state aid increase in 15. Both state aid and um, Correct. Chapter, chapter 71. So that, in effect, we knew would roll out. When we got the state budget and we ended up with additional revenue, um, the 300 and some odd thousand, <clears throat> the 300 and some odd thousand um, in the combined chapter 70 and chapter 71, you can see that we actually, the revised budget, we're just saying if. So, so sure, in fiscal 15, Kathy, we, we knew we built the budget and, and banked on the receiving chapter 70 and 71 proceeds, additional money. So if I draw your attention to the column that reads fiscal 15 revised budget. So we go down to the chapter 71 line, that 501 763 figure was fully loaded with the amount of additional Chapter 71 money we expected to receive. We then got the unfortunate news that that wouldn't come to pass to the tune of 128,373. So it forced that, what was 501, forced that amount down to 373,390. Which, which was the original budget that we voted. Right, right. right. so, so right. that additional state aid would have floated right through to our e &D. Right, so that's what I'm trying to understand. So you originally planned to put in 500000 in E&D last year. Correct, yeah. And when you heard that there might be some more revenue coming from the state, your estimate to, to, for your E&D you know, use would have been 181. Correct. And then you heard, no, it wasn't really coming. So now it's 309. Yeah. So is that what it is now, 309? Would be. So even though you planned on using 500 this year, you're probably going to use less than 500. Well, unless the all the other things. No, I understood that, right. but you have a little bit of of, of this up. you still intended to use 500, and and the state aid still helped out on that end, right? So there's a little oh, bit yeah. of okay. We're, we're, we're still receiving 190 thousand dollars in additional capital seventy. 70. And that's why this is 309. That's right. right. Thank because, you. Yeah, because the line, the line, the first light blue line of 70 went up by 192.46. Right. Okay. That's what I just want to understand. In, in the last several years, though, once you factor in state aid that was higher than it was budgeted and turn back from the operating budgets, we have been, well, we have not consumed D and D. If we budgeted five hundred thousand, I think the year that we budgeted seven hundred and fifty thousand, we did. Right, I remember that. We yes. added only about a hundred and twenty. Yeah, right. right. That money came from the other accounts. Yeah. Right. Okay. Seven hundred and fifty. Thank you. Now I could explain it to somebody else if they asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And, and you can sit up here next question. time. <laughs> so I, I think it's safe to say it, it reflects that there's some traditional budget, you know, conservative budgeting usually going on on the revenue side. Right. And often on the expense side. Right. Any other questions on the operating budget? Mary, you? Good as I'm going to be. It's yeah. <laughs> good, Mary. You don't have any more questions, questions in our room. <laughs> yeah. Actually, let's go to the worst thing. Looking at, at this, you know, what's used up here. The variant and, that's for the 15. For 50. Variants, yes, yeah. Right. So, um, and tied in with this, um, what's left of E and D, or what's going to end up going in from E and D. Okay. So, it's showing, you know, a grand total of unencumbered funds of three, three million five seven six four forty. All right. You know, As a figure, but, but, a debt payment. We don't cover that. Um, okay. Purchase. Okay. Then, that? well, I because I'm looking at it and I know no. it's not that, but because um, that would be yeah, no, unbelievable. That's, that's basically going to come right off of that. Um, right. But so I, my sort of no matter the number of my point is just sort of the same, which is um, when we end up with money left in the budget unencumbered at the end of the year, um, whatever that amount is. Um, now looking at the E and D number, does that's that number that you're just talking about, Kathy, that's without anything flowing back from FY15? No, or no. no, that's with that. That's with yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's like this replenishment kind of cycle. Okay. They just use it again. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. What we're also basing even our conservative estimate on no, no improvement or let's say rest restoration of the previous increase that got pulled back. Right. In the current fiscal year, we're assuming worst case that the budget is rolled forward at a zero percent increase for the region. Right. Absolutely. But and there is that possibility that we could get more, or is that? Do you think that's absolutely not possible? No more. Right. But but it still it's, might happen. We'd be happy, but I'm not yeah. yeah. the yeah. budget on it. No, no. no I'm just asking. Given the shortfall. Think that there at least some. Let's go on. Go positive <laughs> surprise. Ooh. All right. You need to the right. Full, yeah. yes. um, Michael and Laurie. This is this three page document has been forwarded on to the capital committee chairs and is included in the electronic version of our budget that's online. Uh, my apologies if you're not copies out. In the audience, um, oh, we have have it. Oh, you do have it? No, I'm asking, do okay. we? Yes, I think it's in here. Um, no, it this is it. No, it's in our past. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. okay, the, the capital team has been trying to catch up on some late, uh, large projects, and so Sunday night we finally caught up. All right, uh, what's different, I think, since the, the last time is our, our two key uh, decisions. They kind of in a sense compensate or, or weigh each other out. We finally got numbers from the company that does the installation services for um, a highly uh, highly energy efficient LED lighting, which we are uh, would be implementing out around the external parts of the property. And that number originally started in our uh, capital budget at 150 thousand, and we're now down to 45 thousand based upon an exact specification of what we want and a pretty solid estimate of the additional subsidies we get from NSTAR for implementing this type of energy saving uh, technology. Uh, we also trimmed a little bit from the, the well project. So that's what brings us down to 312000 on a line item specifically scheduled basis. Um, after some discussion, uh, we felt like in this year, now that we're three years out past the original study, 
for uh, when items would start to need replacement or refurbishment. And those <coughs> prices were estimated in 2012, particularly when the, the construction economy was still fairly weak in New England. Um, we are including a, a blanket 15% contingency on these projects for this year until we start to see how the bidding comes out for the myriad of painting, carpentry, uh, or not car carpet, not carpentry, carpeting, and, and other projects that are enumerated on page three of this listing. Um, the exact number due to um, a use of a rounding formula is really $312,000. Uh, $218 or something of that nature. Um, it still comes out to $358,000 because I would just adjust the contingency now. We wanted to also keep it consistent with the IMA that was signed uh, in January before we had final numbers for the lighting project. The industry rule of thumb is generally, and we have seen this happen um, in some of the other uh, districts uh, with a where the actual project costs have exceeded the original estimates. So even the Pine Hill is starting to put um, a contingency for the various projects they're doing. And with the industry standard, as I said, is about 15 percent. And we'll carefully track the projected cost per line item and what the final bid cost we get back in, in case that we need formal bids or the re estimate costs, or however we approach it, we don't have to do a formal bid process. And that can provide us information to say how accurate it is the on site, in site costs now as we're getting further away from the original report date. And if it turns out that you know, we were very conservative, then we would that could give us some guidance for the next couple of years as well. Just a quick question, Michael. On, um, when now, when we're buying capital, items for cash as opposed to actually going out and bonding right the choice would be up to each town no i know that but okay. i mean assuming that we do okay you know yeah. so, so you do you know okay that, that's so, your pleasure to hear from you. yeah uh, <laughs> so yeah so assuming that we buy an item for cash we vote to fund our section yeah. up with cash and we allocate that cash um, and in the end, it doesn't cost that much. What happens to the excess? Where does that go? I think that it's, that it's, is in the a, past. It sat in the Warren article account. Is that right, Chris? And but you know, what, what it's, is different. It's is different this, when you blind it. It's gone. But the IMA specifically says it would be turned back. To be turned back to the town. Okay. Or an agreement could be reached to use it for another project. No, 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 we're good. We'll take it. <laughs> well, 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 or for the next year's. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So on page two, if there are any other questions, I would like to bring you this uh, to the attention that, that two of these large projects uh, I think are, are, are very positive investments in yeah. terms of either investing for you know, utility efficiencies and getting payback from reduced electricity costs over the next duration of these units that are installed, or in the case of the well, um, for other factors. So you know, based upon the information we received from NSTAR's affiliate, uh, we're taking what is a load of 35,000 and 500 watts and reducing it uh, anywhere between 7,700 to 11,000 watts in round numbers. And so from a usage standpoint, we could end up saving anywhere between 34,000 to 48,000 kilowatts per year. So I'm sure that the sharp eyes out in the, in the audience next year will remind us this when they get to the utility market. <laughs> doesn't mean your rate will go down. This is a 35, 5, 30. This is a, a fraction of our total just for what? So this is everything we use for everything. No, this is the load for the fixtures that they modeled as part of 
this renovations um, replacement now uh, what you you've got. So Michael, this assumes a fixed rate in the coming years. Um uh, on utility costs. Yes. But it, it assumes a, a fixed rate for whatever length period of time that we're looking at. And I modeled it at the eleven cents that we pay for the variable utility costs. Okay. And at sixteen cents if for some reason this have happened to reduce our peak demand. So most commercial accounts, including the school, have a surcharge each month based upon the peak amount of electricity you're drawing off of the grid and that funds the, the grid infrastructure. Exactly when the peak cost is at the school, you would have to install some devices, you know, on your, your, your machine so you can measure it every 15 minutes because the utility actually has really no clue how much people are drawing. They just know what the total is at whatever period they take a snapshot of the bill. We've done this process a while back at our church. And, no. So, yeah. So ultimately, the, uh, yeah. The payback looks so strong. Yeah. I'm not sure we. Yeah, but it, awesome. yeah, in terms of what projects that the town, you know, the school is taking on to be more efficient overall with our operating. Well, analyzed. It's just so nice to dwell on the things that are actually going to be making money. Another <laughs> <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So the so that in the end, the pay payback. At the best case, could be in just within you know two two and a half years. Looks like in a conservative way, still under four thousand years. And then again, that's a good example. The, the bulbs do last time, so actually it is easier on the custodial staff because they don't have to do some particularly challenging light replacements. And sometimes some of these projects have to have an outside contract to be done for OSHA reasons. Um, the well is a little more complicated in that we don't know water usage that when we have a shortfall off of our one single well it's made up from medfield so in this last year we had a particularly heavy demand of water from medfield now that could either be because we had a particularly heavy irrigation year or it could be that the well itself is is becoming fundamentally less efficient at drawing water from its current configuration and it's it's you know, replenishment rate or whatever the term is, is, is degrading. So in that situation, we modeled it from the current, you know, worst case usage um, going forward from that field or more of an average over the last, you know, four or five years. And so there the payback, un, you know, very similar anywhere from two and a half to 4.8 years. And again, the savings comes from no longer needing to draw water from that field to replenish the, the backup tank. For irrigation and, and uh, fire suppression, and it also provides us actually for the insurance that the first well was that would fail, we would have we'd be able to draw upon a second well and cut off, cut down what we would have to pay from you know, Medfield in the direction. But at one point, there was there, um, I, I only know this that it's somewhere in my brain that in the operating budget there is money for water that, yes, that might go away if we get this. 30 would go away if this well uh, okay. were to come through. It's, it's a pretty 3, small thirty nine hundred and thirty dollars Okay. Yes. And when does when do we find out about that? When this passes at town meeting. So well, the next the well is installed. <laughs> right. Right. So, so I'm smart here. <laughs> Okay, so, so it would be in the FY17 budget. So it, it's not see this, the change. No, it won't no, be when this passes. It won't change. It won't change this budget. No, no, there's a line in yeah. the operating budget that goes up by 3930 that would not go up if the second well were online, which is right. going to be sometime so during the So, so it won't be when this passes. It will be yeah, sometime. Next, it's once right. the well is installed. Right. 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 Now, right. hopefully the well could be installed. But it could be a priority. As Claire priority. said, we'll see it. We'll definitely see FY17. Right. Awesome. Great. Thank you. I have a question. Right. So, well, <laughs> I just wanted to ask Michael. So, you said you sent this to both capital committees, and um, are you meeting with them again? Are you meeting with Dover again, for example? Or are you just talking with them? Sorry, I can meet with Dover if they want. I, 
can we find hey, the, the process in Sherborne is a one more once round on capital items after the the operating budget items are discussed um, on the Saturday fiscal meeting when sometime in March, correct? 21st. March 21st, <laughs> I will not. I will not so, be I will be around. But for Dover, I don't know if Bob has asked. Last time I checked with Bob, he was he, he just was looking for what was going into the blue box. Well, that's why I'm asking. So this is a slightly different breakdown of the costs. So here's a blue book analysis that I sent to Bob. I can give this to you if you want it. It's, been, it's something that he has. Um, okay. Need a copy of it no, I just out. wanted you to be sure to ask him whether or not it's strategic to put in 15,000, that 15% 15 is a contingency versus oh, increase right. each mm -hmm. item by 15%. Yeah, that's exactly oh. the question we asked him. It's on, a strategic yes. question. So yes. I don't think there's going to be any question about what you're doing or the plan to do right. it. I think it's logical. But I do think you, you there may be a strategy that may be different in the towns. But I think in Dover, it will be okay. to um, not necessarily leave 15, a certain number out there that could people might right. see is you unnecessary about that? Yeah. You yeah. Understand. so as yeah, long as you just that. talk with them specifically that's my only suggestion thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Yeah. thank you yeah. all right um so we have we have three mm -hmm. motions that we need to make then uh with respect to the budget the first is a motion to adopt to certify the regional school district's fiscal 16 budget I will read them and then I will ask for the motion and the second and then any more discussion. And I'll email to give this to you. Uh, so the first is a motion to adopt the 2015-16 budget in the amount of $23,036,986, which is reduced by estimated receipts and available funds in the amount of $2,871,442 for a net amount to be assessed to the member towns of $20,000,000 one hundred sixty-five thousand eight seventy-seven. This assessment is comprised of eighteen million seven hundred seventy-nine thousand six six hundred thirty-three operating expenses and one million three hundred eighty-five thousand nine hundred eleven dollars in debt expenses, and that the treasurer be authorized to certify this budget in the apportioned share of each town based on the statutory method. Okay. So moved. All right. Second. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? Mm -hmm. Should that agree with these numbers? Yes, yes. it does. I just Why? Well, I, I didn't to me. I heard twenty thousand one sixty five eight seven seven. Yeah, and I see twenty thousand one sixty five five forty four. On your. February 27th. No, I'm looking at the 226 one on the package. Did the it one change? in the packet. Mm -hmm. It changed. Yeah, you, you are dated um, That's March 3rd. No. no, this is 226 from the packet. No, we don't have it. So. I have a 216 Yeah, that's. That's what's on the handout that was in the packet. So this is the high water. So yeah, but we need to get these numbers into t our town. So I just want to be sure I get them the right ones. Yeah. Right, but what I'm saying, Kathy, is if if it's not clear, if this is the higher number, we vote this, and then we can. Move I understand it. that. Yeah, we. So if they can't, want to vote around the number. Right, but if they can't sort that now. Well, you know, yeah, because it looks like everything else is right except for that one number. In the motion. Yeah. Because 2306 is right. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000. 2,000,000.
You can just send us the right numbers yeah. later in an email. That's fine, well, too. We, well, well, let's take two minutes and we can figure it out. Yeah. So you need to go back. Then Whatever we'll you, whatever's good for the committee. I would just make change the motion. To be, uh, so what they said was, they said that number before it was a right. I, I, I just happened to be reading it. So once I knew what I was. Uh, no, you know what? I prefer to take the motion and then I'll check the number. We can lower it then. Because okay. okay. I like to tie out things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know what, Chris? I, I actually think it does tie to two. Actually, the, the two, if you subtract yes, two you get one from 23, you get the five. Four, you get this five eight, seven, eight, eight, seven, seven is That's what I'm saying. Well. Yeah. It, it is just have the motion. Because every other number in there every is Every other flat. number fits. Okay, so, so, so the, if you take 23 million, 036, mm -hmm. 986, mm -hmm. and subtract two million, eight, seven, mm -hmm. one, four, forty two, you get 20. Million one sixty five yeah. five forty four. I think it's just. Yeah. I think yeah. The motion was typed. Incredible. So, four and seven actually. Yeah, that's right. Richard, that's what I was just going to look for. Okay. Actually, do you have a question about our process and site? Wait one second, Chris. There's a question. So. We are voting to certify and advance the number that is essentially from the ultra conservative approach. Yes, okay. the reduction is paying for chapter 71. So, between now and other key dates going forward, either Sherborne's fiscal meeting on March 21st or any other dates that are critical before Prince goes to town meeting book lists. Will we have enough information from any of the budgets that are that are produced uh, and we can help that might move us from an ultra conservative projection of our revenues to a conservative or even mildly optimistic? I really think that given we have a new governor to work with the general assembly or uh, the legislative units, um, I couldn't answer that. I mean, I've, I've seen him go right down the conference committee before we even know our number. However, there was a commitment by the legislative branch because people need these numbers. They passed the resolution confirming um, uh, previous government state aid numbers in March. That's all I can share at this stage. So, what is our process then of? Dialogue with our with our budget committees from both Dover and Sherborne regarding where our budget is relative to guidance from specifically from Sherborne and or Dover's you know reaction to this being on the budget or otherwise. Do we have a process that we know we are converging on something? Or I'm actually confused now because the the number I was looking at. Yeah, I was looking at the conservative approach, and you're now voting the ultra conservative approach because that's what Michael's saying. That's Are, what's confusing me. Aren't we? If I followed, <laughs> maybe I didn't follow the right. I, Right. Oh, then that would be the conservative. Okay. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah, that's what I thought okay. you were I'm, voting, and now I, I'm yeah, like, I'm wait, just, stop. Yeah. Looking yeah. at left and right. Yeah. Okay. Saying. All right. Okay. Lining up. Okay. So the motion, the motion has been corrected for a typo. Well, you can withdraw the motion. So reissue it as stated with that. Reissue it as stated with the number corrected. I don't need to reread it though. Okay, good. Amy can do that. Okay. Yes, we need to read motion and second. second. So okay. Any more discussion? All the all those in favor? Aye. Okay. 
Second motion, the Department of Revenue requires a vote of the Regional School Committee authorizing the amount of excess and deficiency, E&D, for the fiscal year 2016 budget. Following is the motion. Motion to utilize E&D. The fiscal year 2016 budget shall include $500,000 of the June 30, 2015 certified excess and deficiency to reduce assessments. Do I have a motion? All right, second. Second by Carolyn. Any more discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Right. And the final motion uh, is to utilize revolving funds in the fiscal year 2016 budget. The motion to utilize revolving funds. The fiscal year 2016 budget shall make use of $30,000 from the athletic revolving fund and $17,000 from the school lunch revolving fund. So moved. Second? All right. Well, any more discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Can pass that to you, please? Yep. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, the motion is to approve the capital number of five hundred of three hundred fifty-eight thousand, three hundred fifty-eight thousand, as presented by our capital secretary. Do we already do this? I think we hit that number anyway, but now that the IMA is here, we, oh, okay. it's probably good to just confirm it. <laughs> All right, I'll move that one. Second? Clear? Clear. All right, any more discussion? I think we've heard a lot of that. All right, all in favor? All right, okay. We could, we could circulate these the original IMAs, one cross and one for each member account. They're signed by the selection. Please control me, go lay down and sign third page. All right. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, and it may be the exact same question somebody else asked and I was reading, so I apologize ahead of time. So if, if there's more information in the next week about um, what's going to be in the governor's budget, numbers you actually see and all that, um, will you be coming back to this number at all? I, the governor's budget is so preliminary. Um, even that, I don't think... It will give us an indication if we're going to do something better than level one or cut, but I don't think until it really gets through the whole process. So no. Yeah. No. Okay. Most okay. likely no. That's fine. I just want to be sure. So these will be the numbers that go in the blue book. Yes. yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any more on budget? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's get through the. the um, we have a, a donation, an anonymous donation uh, of, of uh, five hundred dollars from a family that can remain anonymous, uh, with the funds to be used to support Span DS. Any, uh, any? So again, I have my issue that Span DS is an outside organization. We're taking money to give to them. They, this is a, this is, it's the one donation that comes in. I know, I know. It's strange, it's given to us to use for the social media. Yeah, and I encourage them to become a 501 basically. That's really good. All right. Um, any more discussion? All right, all in favor? I'm actually. Are you? Okay, so we're 4 0 and 2. Um, school choice. Every year, the school committee needs to uh, vote whether to participate in the school choice program. Keeping in mind that uh, students who go to the Porsche one can always choice out. This is a vote uh, taken annually by every school committee across the country whether you want to allow students to choice in to your school. And uh, we historically, School committee's historically in three different votes against being a school choice receiving mission, and um, that has been the long term vote. All right. Um, do we have a motion about school choice? We do not participate. We do not participate in school choice. We do not participate in school choice program. We have a second. Second. Okay. Any more discussion on that? Uh, all those in favor? Right. Very big unanimous. All right. The last item on here, which I'll be pretty brief on because I asked to focus on, um, 
I continue to believe that we have an opportunity to better communicate mm -hmm. with our constituents, and I'd love to try and figure out how to flesh out the school committee web page that's on our on our overall site, and perhaps as simple as taking the packet that's done and breaking it back up into its component pieces and be able to communicate out to parents if you have a high school student and want to know what's going on, click here and read the headmaster's report. If you have a middle school or you want to know what's going on, click here on Mr. Kelly's report. I just feel like people don't read a 140 page packet. I wouldn't. Um, have to, I don't Somebody know. did. I did. <laughs> yeah, but I totally agree and it's funny, I've been thinking about that. Um, in Medfield, a bunch of their couple of their selectmen have actually have blogs about what went on at the selectmen's right. meetings, and I think it would be really useful to do something like that because you know, sometimes I go on and I look to see what happened at the meeting, and you can't you can't get the minutes until the next meeting. Right. So I think that's a great idea. I would um, I would favor that we do some of that posting and then combine it with a, a very simple email that people can opt into which I've seen successfully used in Wellesley and it just it's almost like the minutes of things like the town you know the regional school committee approved this year's budget and right. it would link to your budget presentation right. or if there was a presentation around MCAS and SAT performance that was done and then there would be a link to that document right and there's not a lot of write-up in the newsletter right. it's right. just very minute style that wouldn't take a lot of so a lot of thought for, for my crafting. suggestion because um, PTO has struggled with the same issue and recently we learned of a student through L'Oreal Gary who would like some community service hours to assist so maybe there's more than one student in our high school great right. because it's it is time consuming um, right to manage that I mean, I manage somebody else's social media, and it's time consuming. Right. Well, what we're trying to do is come up with something that doesn't require new content to be written, because that always seems right. to be the bottleneck. It's really cool for the first month or two, and then no one wants to do it anymore. So, so we're trying to figure out a way to use what's already being developed here and just get it well, out. Well, and it's more. almost taking our bullet points from the agenda and then linking them. And linking it, it, like breaking up the packet and making it easier for people to navigate what has gone on over the course of an hour and a half. And I don't think that's to be the whole. Packet. Yeah. It's just the oh right the highlights the best. You know, best some people might want to read the whole thing, and then they can drill down and click on different things. And then maybe there is one paragraph that the chair writes about what's going to happen at this meeting, in a prose way, just to give some context. Or you know, if it's a limited amount, I think you could do that. When an earlier version of our packets um, that may have been compiled by a Dente or somebody I don't know who assisted her. She did make use of the table of contents feature of PDF that from the electronic, admin, from the electronic it does, does it does still, still does. does. That's right. And it's what the wall? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. It seemed like when we used to get it, it was there and, and that, that was, so maybe you know, that was yeah, one point that we now at least it's a yeah. So that works. I mean, and one could in fact put the table of contents into put the table of contents. To the, so that you could click on a link that would take you to a part of the video. Oh. That's the part you And just breaking apart. That's yeah. supposed to be. And when do we get the new website? So, um, probably another six to eight weeks. We're moving all the content right now. So, point people in each building across the school system have been identified and move all to migrate all the data, which is really quite an undertaking. Yeah. Our new vendor will be the final site. Um, so we've had a trainer come in, and it's just it's sort of on top of everything that people are doing. So Mary Lasivit in the high school has this now added on as something she's trying to move all of the data from the existing website and literally copying it onto the website. Otherwise, it would have been another like $20,000 commitment to have a company do this. So anyway, so so do you think in general this is like a reasonable as long as we're not generating new content as, as long as it's not, not new staff content, to do anything no comment, more. no yeah, just I, it's not a great idea. Why wouldn't you want to have you know okay. a little bit more community engagement? Okay, then I will. I, I like the idea. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know whether the chair is interested or not, but but something you know, brief and chatty that is not. <laughs> Give me brief and chatty. Yeah. <laughs> 
Did you write it for him? Apparently, Twitter <laughs> is perfect for him. Uh, <laughs> Isn't it shared Twitter? Um, um, at RFC. I can tell you how we're doing it. So oh, we'll perfect. Okay, we can make it easier. Excellent. All right. Perfect. So that was my point about communication. All right. Um, consent agenda. We have three items on our consent agenda. We have our committee meeting yeah, meeting minutes of February 5th. An overnight field trip request for the Global Leadership Inquiry Program on April 3rd of this year, and the preview of the overnight field trip to Costa Rica, uh, which will now be the third year running, I believe, of this program in February of 2016. Do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. a second. Second. Any other questions? I just, I just wanted to say one of two things is possible. Either Amy has has done such an extraordinary job that there's never anything to correct. I just found two things. <laughs> or, <laughs> or we need Ellen Williams. So. Uh, but we need to read more carefully. Yeah. I gave and, Brian Marringer a bit of a uh, promotion. Oh, good. <laughs> That's why I know I picked it up. <laughs> no, I know it's not that. So, I'll send it all right. Thanks. All right. I, have my no, now we I would not know what's going on in my life. I didn't come to this meeting. <laughs> Congratulations. So now we need to vote. Okay. So yes. So we need to uh, consent agenda. But yes. All those in favor of the consent agenda. Okay. Perfect. All right. For your review in the packet with the March enrollment report. Um, the Sherman minutes, the Dover minutes, if you have any ideas for the April regional meeting. And the one thing I did forget um, to say early on was uh, the Dover caucus, the caucuses that are coming up. Um, the original, when the papers came out last week around the uh, open spots, they were incorrect for Dover. So just to clarify, uh, if anyone made it to this part of the meeting, we do have two spots open. We have a three year term and a one year term. Um, so those are the two that are open. And the Dover School Committee, just in case people know, that was also long. They had two, and there's really only one. And we have, do we have people running so, from here? So right, so the, so my, so I'm, my career, my career spot is up, and Lori had been appointed for one year, and there's one year remaining on Shelly Colson's. And actually right now, as of now, I'm planning to run for the one, we're sw switching, so I'm gonna run for the one year, and Lori is gonna run for the three year. So, and obviously, if anybody else is interested out there, they should talk to us and let us know. And then, Sherburn, someone was Michael. We practicing Thursday night, so we'd like to do it early when there's still snow on the ground. Or well, Monday, so. And, you, and there's, there's one, one position for, for three years. School committee. And I will be advancing my Your name. My name. <laughs> Somebody will be on my behalf. And then I know there are two for the uh, Sherburn School Committee. Two openings? Two, well, two positions that are available. Right. One currently um, occupied by Susan Hamlin and the second by Greg Garland. And I do not have specific yeah, final two, confirmations three, three, of those two three three year terms. Okay. So they're on it. Uh, Adrian? Any other questions? All right. Then I will. Wow. Yes. I'm really